Best ever listeners, welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. We only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any of that fluffy stuff. With us today, Emmett Smith. How you doing, Emmett? I'm good, Joe. How are you? I'm doing well. Nice to have you on the show. And obviously, best ever listeners, you know who Emmett Smith is. But in case you didn't know some things about him, let me quickly mention a couple things. One, he is the owner of E. Smith Legacy, which is a real estate investment and development company. He also has a couple enterprise companies, E. Smith Realty Partners and E. Smith Construction. He's the co-owner of The Gents Place, yep. which is the ultimate men's grooming and lifestyle club. We're going to be talking about that. I need to get there, by the way. I need to get over there soon. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I'm getting a little rough in the beard, the beard area. I need to, I need to look smooth. Just need to shape it up a little bit. That's all. That's right. And um, well, he's played a little football along the way. So Emmett, what are you up to? What's your focus right now? Uh, my focus is obviously uh, uh, on a lot of things that we that you just mentioned. All of my real estate companies, uh, as well as my construction company, uh, we have a couple things that we're working on that are pretty significant in the infrastructure space. And so, um, uh, just busy. Uh, we just concluded up our uh, uh, Emma Smith Invitational Golf Tournament back uh, just about three weeks ago, and now we're planning and, and getting everything geared up for the Emma Smith Grand Fondo, which is happening September the thirtieth here in Dallas for work. And so there's a lot of other things that's going on from a business as well as from a charitable perspective, but uh, very busy, very busy. I got NFL uh, people around me right now doing some, uh, um, some things, uh, the day in the life uh, of, uh, or, you know, of myself. So there's a lot going on. How do you determine how to prioritize your time? Well, the way I see it, I have uh, only so many hours in the course of a day uh, to get as much of much work as possibly done. Uh, and, uh, and I try to prioritize uh, how these things absolutely work in terms of either, number one, um, helping every company that I, that, that, that I own uh, prosper and grow. Uh, number two, uh, assist the brand in terms of more brand awareness for not only myself individually, but also for all my companies that, that I actually, uh, that, that's under my uh, leadership, but uh, including our charitable components. So I try to prioritize these things. Do they all work together or is something so far out of the box that is going to take up too much of my time and do I really want to do it? Mm. Everything that I'm doing thus far, I'm extremely, extremely passionate about. And so everything I'm doing, I don't have any, any, any pullbacks because everything, it, it just flows. It flows within the course of my day, uh, daily schedule. And, uh, and I, I take time for every last uh, piece of it. With the different ventures, I mean, you mentioned a golf tournament, you mentioned real estate, you've got, you're the you know, co-owner of the gents place. You're helping with that. What's right now taking up the majority of your focus um, when you look at all the stuff that you're working on? Well, the beautiful thing about it is I don't have to do it all myself. And that's, let's make that very, very clear. Uh, the one thing I learned a long time ago, you surround yourself with great teammates. Um, Emma Smith did not become the all-time leading rusher, uh, all because he was out there blocking for himself, handing the football to himself, and throwing the football to himself, let alone calling the plays. And so I had uh, a supporting cast, and that supporting cast afforded me the opportunity to do what I do best. And that's the same thing that I have here within my uh, corporations. Um, I have great leadership uh, uh, executives that are helping uh, push the, uh, the ball, if you will, uh, down the stream. Uh, and, 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 and we communicate constantly. And uh, so that part is very helpful. The one thing I have learned, one of the challenges that, that we all face in business is not necessarily uh, whether or not the concept or the idea is the right one, is whether or not we have the right people to help us make that concept and that, that dream or that idea become successful. And so far, I feel like I've uh, surrounded myself by a great group of men and women uh, to help fulfill that dream. I imagine that's a unique challenge that you face starting out because people, a lot of people knew who you were. And with that comes a lot of people who want to get your money <laughs> and not necessarily look out for your best interests. That and is so, a 
That is true. But go ahead. Yeah. So, so with your starting out, how did you identify the right people to surround yourself with and how have you, how has that evolved if it has evolved at all? Well, that has been one of the hardest tasks um, to try and, and, and I ain't going to say master, but to, to, to get as good as you possibly can with it. Obviously, I, well, I ain't going to say obviously, but outside of uh, my own intuitions and my own questions that I'm going to ask every person that I interview with, uh, I use a filtering system that, uh, that I go through in terms of hiring, um, having um, HR department spend time with people, doing background research, interviewing folks before they actually sit in front of me. And then I come with a whole nother level of sets of questions uh, that's maybe sports oriented, but also give me some insight in terms of who the individual might be, what type of work ethic they actually have. Uh, but the most important thing I try to find within people is are people really credible? Uh, can you really do what you say you can do? And the only way you can really feel, figure that out is through, through trial and error. Um, therefore, I mean, I don't mind giving a 60 day window here to try and figure out whether or not you have the capabilities of picking up something fairly quick and executing against something. And most of the times it's just a matter of conversation. Your thought process also is a big indicator of how you think about certain things. Do you think about things in a silo or do you, are you able to be broad thinker? and think outside of a silo and bring it back into context to where it's applicable to the situation or the cause uh, at hand. So uh, there's a lot of different techniques that you have to learn. Mm. Do you have a favorite interview question when they finally get to finally go through the entire process and finally get to you and have the conversation? Well, um, it, it flows. It, it depends on, uh, number one, the resume that's in front of me, the person that's sitting in front of me, the conversation that we're actually having. And uh, obviously, I like to know where people see themselves. I like to understand, are you, do you, where do you see yourself in the next five years? I mean, are you just coming here to get a job or do you have a mission? Mm -hmm. Do you have a goal? Do you have a vision for uh, how you how you see yourself within this corporation? Do you see that the landscape is open? Do we have enough opportunity for you to become what you aspire to be? And uh, if you cannot see yourself being successful in here, then you're not the right person. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to know how people envision themselves working within our platform. You mentioned, or we talked about earlier, the different types of ventures that you're involved in. And you said that you're, you're passionate about each of those ventures. Mm -hmm. I imagine that you're presented opportunities that you could be passionate about. Like you you could be like, you know what, that sounds really interesting, but perhaps you don't, perhaps you don't enter into a partnership or invest or create a company around it. What is the difference between the ventures that you have decided to move forward with that you're passionate about and the ones that perhaps you could be, but you don't move forward with? Right. That's a great question. Um, when you think about our platform, which, which, which you stated at the top of the show, East Memphis Legacy, which is a real estate development company. So we build things. We, we are merchant developers, uh, shopping centers, mixed use uh, projects uh, in terms of uh, retail, office, uh, hospitality, um, um, multifamily. Um, all of those things are part of the mixed use umbrella that we actually have from a development standpoint. And we're currently venturing off into the MOB space, medical office space. So when we put all those things together, uh, it creates a nice little dynamic mi mix there. That's the development arm. And then we start talking about the brokerage services arm. Well, we represent clients that want to be in those type of mixed uses, you know, uh, whether it's uh, industrial, off industrial office or retail or medical. Uh, whatever it may be, uh, from a brokerage tenor rep standpoint, you represent a number of clients that actually want to fill some of that space up. And so it's, it kind of worked hand in hand that, that, that way. Mm -hmm. And then you start talking about construction. Whether it's any type, form of development, it's going to require some type of construction work. And so our construction company is not only uh, building roads and bridges, parking garages, but also doing doing site work, infrastructure work, and everything else, which is required for any development that East Smith Legacy does. So it all kinds of work together, kind of gel together 
in its own nice little way. Construction may take the lead here one day. Development may take the lead another day. Uh, broker services might take the lead on, on, on another day. So um, everything that we do touch some form of real estate or some form of development that somebody aspired to either own or develop themselves. Mm -hmm. Guys, yeah. So you, so you, you basically got from a, 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 a three sixty, yeah, three sixty. Yeah, vertically integrated everything. Yeah. Got it. Makes sense. I I read in an article. I think it was a recent article where you implied that the construction part of your business is the part. I don't know if it was keeps you up at night or something, but it was the challenging part because you're spending dollars and you don't have a return for you know twelve twenty four months. Right. Um, what, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. Construction is one of the most. <laughs> when I first got into the business, my uh, CEO said, "You sure you want to do this? Because you can probably make more money going to sign an autographs than doing." <laughs> uh, which he was absolutely probably correct in terms of the stress level. Uh, but construction is uh, is an outpouring of cash outlay early on. It's on an accrual basis, so uh, we can be on a job site for almost ninety days. In some cases, one hundred twenty days before we actually get our pay out. And so we we probably have outlaid somewhere between 200 to a half a million dollars uh, before we get our pay application, uh, our first pay application. And, and, and in some cases you spend a lot of time debating and arguing with the person about the work that you've done. The work is in place, you've moved on to the next phase, you've been cleared to go, and yet you still want to argue they're trying to beat you down some more from a financial standpoint, which is absolutely ludicrous in my, in my opinion. Because uh, I come from the world where if you perform your job, you get compensated for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a rigged system because we find ourselves um, financing the project, which is, uh, which is not cool, mm -hmm. and to, to get a small amount of return. But my reason for doing it was I got sick and tired of hearing that they could not find um, qualified minority African-American mm -hmm. companies uh, that could do the job, can do the work. And I got sick and tired of hearing it because it's a, it's a big old myth. Uh, the reason why you can't find them because some of the general contractors, some of the big boys uh, are constantly uh, doing things to uh, run smaller minority companies out of business mm -hmm. uh, by accelerating the, uh, the schedule. Well, if you're a small minority contractor and they, ex they accelerate a, a $14 million uh, project, accelerate the schedule on you, you just went from maybe doing $50,000 a week to $100,000 a week, and you got to wait 90 to 120 days right. to pay back. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to do. And so mm -hmm. that's why I say it's one of those very difficult things, difficult businesses to be in, and it's one of those things that will keep you up at night. Mm -hmm. And how do you mitigate the risk as much as possible or navigate that so that it doesn't keep you up as many nights in a row as perhaps it could? Well, the first thing we try to do is to find very good relationships uh, with general contractors and owners who have uh, better pay terms, if you will, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and performance clauses, if that's even possible. Um, establishing that type of relationship in the marketplace is absolutely critical to the success of any small minority business. And so uh, that's one thing. Risk mitigation comes in the facts or in the context of how do we uh, estimate a project and how do we find a snake in the wood pile, if you will, even in the construction space. Uh, so we try to eliminate problems before we actually get on the job site. Uh, then most importantly, uh, safety, uh, being OSHA compliant, uh, compliant. And so safety is, is a huge part of, of everything that we do. And so, uh, making sure that every person that's on our job site, uh, go to work the same, come home the same way they went to work that morning. Yeah. Right. Perhaps with, um, a little bit more dirt on their clothing, but otherwise no, not the same. Dirt on the clothing. <laughs> that could be washed off, but we want fingers and toes yeah. and fingers <laughs> And stuff like that. <laughs> yep. With so the pr the primary you know audience for my show is real estate investors. So what is your best real estate investing advice ever for them? <laughs> one of the, one of the simplest form of investing advices I've ever received came from Jerry Jones himself. He told me years ago, 
He said, Amen, have a big front door and a small back door. Big front door and a small back door. Now, how does that play in the context of real estate? Well, obviously, uh, from a development standpoint, obviously you want to do big projects. Mm -hmm. And the more projects that you do are quality size and the more that you're capable of getting done, then you have a big front door. Obviously, you don't want to, you don't want to spend or expense as much at the back door. In other words, take in as much as you can and let out little on the backside. Mm. How have you applied that in either one business or your overall approach? Overall approach, I would say we touched on it a little bit ago when we start when we were talking about the construction business, risk mm -hmm. mitigation. Right. How can we set up our contracts, whether it's brokerage services or development contracts, to the point where we can alleviate as much of the risk as possible um, and try to be as fair as possible with, with our contractors uh, as well. And so um, that's important, whether we utilize an architecture firm that has BIM technology to attach, to, 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 to find uh, our collision issues in, in the drawings that we may have and, and mitigate those things before we get on the job site. Uh, which is absolutely huge because it saves us money on change orders and everything else. All of that is important. And so um, those are some of the things that we try to do is contractual language and risk mitigation in terms of uh, um, design criteria. Mm -hmm. You ready for, we do a, a lightning round of questions. Usually they're, they're the same questions, but prior to our conversation, I asked the audience to submit questions. So we've got some personalized questions for you. Are you ready for the lightning round? Yeah. All right, let's do it. So if let's see. Answer, if I don't have the answer, I can say pass. That, well, I, well, I, we'll see. We'll see. You, 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 <laughs> so Alton from Detroit asks, how do you identify which opportunities to pursue, which we kind of touched on. So if, if you yeah. don't want to, if you want to elaborate, you don't have to, but just from a high level. Um, number one, um, I got to have it. Well, not from a real estate development standpoint, it's all, about what's in the market. It's about an I-4 piece of property, number one. What does this property want to be? No matter if it's an old uh, redevelopment play or if it's a piece of land that's vacant, um, but it wants to be something. And then uh, figuring out how to make it, make it happen. Mm -hmm. Some people see challenges and don't want to touch it. Other folks see challenges and want to run right to it because it's those uh, creative minds that pull off something that someone else don't want to do, uh, which is a lot more riskier, but yields a, a much larger return. Um, and I got to be passionate about what it is that I'm trying to get accomplished. And, and then I extrapolate that from the site standpoint to the demographics in the trade area around it. What's in that trade area and what's not in that trade area. Mm -hmm. And I try to move the things that are on the, in the trade area off the table and figure out who really needs to be here and how does the demographic stack up with uh, their, that, that tenant profile. Mm -hmm. Theo from Cincinnati asks, what separates the NFL players who leave the NFL and lose all their money to with the NFL players who leave the NFL and make more money? Well, um, I think we all run the risk of doing things that we're not aware of. Um, one thing I've learned is it's better for me to invest in myself than to invest in others. Uh, because I'm not going to cheat myself. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when you invest in others, others sometimes, uh, again, claim that they could do X, Y, and Z until the rubber meets the road, then you find out that they can't. And so you've made a significant investment in the person uh, just for them to let you down. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, but then the actual management, who you're investing in and how you're investing in these people, also their credibility becomes critical too. I just think that uh, uh, oftentimes we're uh, excited about being in business and not really take the time to understand the business. Mm -hmm. I think everything that I've done I've tried to immerse myself in it to understand the business and how the business actually work itself and asking questions versus being an absentee owner, being an involved owner from start to finish. So you learn that lesson one time versus having to learn that lesson three or four times. 
Makes sense. Bradley from New York City asks, what are you most proud of? What I'm most proud of? Uh, that, that's hard to say. Uh, outside of just just my kids. I got two kids now that are going off to college. One's already in college. One just graduated from high school. And she's off to college uh, going to Texas a and and to play soccer. Uh, and I got three other kids that coming from behind them. And, and they all are good kids. I think uh, I'm most proud of my children in terms of how they've been able to handle uh, not only the success of their parents um, and who we are, but just how they carry themselves as, as young men and, and women. And the last question of the, from the listeners that was selected is, what tr- what's a trait you learned in the NFL? This is from Eric in Cincinnati. What's a trait you learned in the NFL that has been applied in business? Um, I would say teamwork. Um, checking your ego at the door uh, and understanding that um, uh, you do not become successful by yourself. Um, and and it, it involves a lot of people in terms of helping you become successful. Uh, like I said before, I did not hand the football to myself. I did not block for myself. I did not call the plays. And the same thing applies in business. Uh, I got people that help me keep me on, on time for my schedules. I got folks that are uh, in the marketing side. I got folks on the executive director side. I got CEOs and everybody else that, are, that has a job and a responsibility. Uh, doing your job and doing your responsibility protects everybody else. Um, and if, in some cases, I got people that have the ability to do more, a lot more bandwidth than others. And, and that's a beautiful thing. That's, to me, that's a first, second, and third down running back. Not only is he there to run the ball, but on third down, he can go out and catch the ball, and he can also block, which is also extremely important for key people and key personnel in any organization. If you got somebody that has the ability to not only um, um, be a broker, but also has a law degree too. So that expedites certain things too. That covers your back. Um, having engineers that has the capability of not only being a CEO, but also a senior estimator too. And so when it comes down to creating processes and procedures for your organization to run off of and run in a most efficient way, all, all of that, uh, is great knowledge to have. And so, and then you have folks that are just handle one piece, but they do that one piece very, very good. Mm-hmm. And that's a wonderful thing to have. So teamwork becomes such an important thing in every aspect of what we do. In my household, it's the same way. Teamwork, my wife and I got to be on the same page in order to raise all five of our kids and keep them all humble, hungry, and, 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 and knowledgeable in terms of their growth. That is an important aspect of who we are as people is to not only have uh, the ability to share knowledge with one another, but to establish that, that team environment. Mm-hmm. I've read that your book on your bucket list is to be an NFL owner. So let's, is that correct? First off? That is correct. Okay. So let's fast forward and I'd like to congratulate you. You have your pick of the litter. You can pick whichever NFL team you'd like to be an owner of. Um, Which one is last on your list and why? Last on my list. Last on my list. Last. Wow. (sighs) That could be... A number of a number of cities, but obviously I would like to work in cities that I love to visit. <laughs> the weather is perfect or, or good, some kind of way. Sorry, I mean, Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to Detroit, but Detroit has tremendous opportunities. But I'm not a cold weather person, so I would rather be <laughs> on the south side. I mean, West Coast, I could deal with West Coast. Arizona, I could deal with Arizona. Uh, obviously, anything in Texas, I'm good with. Uh, uh, Louisiana, Georgia, Carolina, <laughs> uh, Florida, <laughs> all of those are great, great areas. Uh, and, uh, but you know, if I could pick one team that I could be on, uh, I would want to be a part on of the Dallas Cowboys. Absolutely. And has anyone ever interviewed you while wearing an Emmett Smith Jersey? Like I just did. 
I can't think of in recent <laughs> time. In recent time. <laughs> well, Emmett, thanks for sh spending some time with us. Thanks for talking about your approach, you know, your teamwork approach, uh, and how actively involved you are in learning the process, uh, yeah. learning aspects of the process. And the challenge, I mean, a lot of people um, who, well, people who haven't walked a mile in your shoes or other people's shoes, they have a tough time um, thinking that perhaps everyone has a challenge. Everyone right. has challenges. And yeah. really, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is do you have the right people and how you focus on are they credible and how you qualify that credibility, whether it's a 60-day time, time frame for testing them out um, or other, any number of other filters that you use. And right. so thanks for, thanks for being on the show. How can, where, where should the best ever listeners go to perhaps get more involved in what you're focused on, whether it's the gents place or something else? Go to emmsmith.com. Cool. Emmett, thanks for being on the show. Hope you have a best ever day, my friend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Joe.